lot of Deutsche Marks have gone over the exchange counter since we tagged the BMW 1600 the world's best $2,500 sedan. February, 1967. That was back in the days when you could buy all the Deutsche Marks you wanted for a quarter apiece. Now, after last fall's revaluation, you can't touch a mark for 27 cents, and the same car, well, okay, the same car with 400 more CCS and a handful of options that any best car should have, will set you back a solid $3,500 if you insist on a radio and an automatic transmission you'll have to unroll about 4 grand. As a $3,500 sedan the BMW 2002 isn't looking too tall. For all of the things that you seek in a sedan comfort, room, and general convenience of operation you could do better, for less money, with a Peugeot 504 or a Saab 99 or any number of American intermediates like an Olds Cutlass or a Chevelle. Competition is tough, both in price and in design, in the sedan business, particularly now in a time when smaller, more efficient automobiles are the only high flyers in the marketplace. Considering the delicacies available in the $3,000 to $3,500 sedan range, the BMW 2002 is hard pressed to keep its nose above water. But there are shallower depths in which the 2002 can operate quite happily. Forget about the sedan body and pretend that it's a sports car a transformation that's almost automatic in your mind anyway after you've driven it a mile or two. With the possible exception of the new Datsun 240Z, which is not yet available for testing, the BMW will run the wheels off any of the under $4,000 sports cars without half trying. It is more powerful and it handles better. Of course, forgetting about the BMW sedan body is pure fantasy the upright, block-like shape is too definite to be conjured or contemplated into something more Italian-esque. It is, and always will be, a sedan with all of the attendant styling minuses and convenience pluses that that entails. But, spiritually if not stylistically, it is a sedan with a difference, a sedan that can beat the sports cars at the game they invented. That is the secret of the BMW's uniqueness, and if it continues to flourish in the market at its newly inflated price, it will be for that reason alone. Although its price is far more jarring than its visual impact, the 2002 is a plainly honest machine, a kind of Bavarian roadrunner without the humorous overlay. It's the absolute hot setup in Germany where over 30 fat cats bully their way through schools of BWs on the Autobahnen with much flashing of lights and cold, sideways glances. Opals and Fords are driven by those who have renounced solid German technology in favor of Bokish, Detroit inspired sheet metal and the young man seeking to leave his mark in the well-understood games of traffic saves his money for a BMW 2002, or more likely the vitamin-enriched 2002 Ti. From the outside the two seem identical, but the Ti generates 22 more horsepower with the aid of a pair of two BBL side draft Solexes and more compression, and its bigger stronger brakes. Stronger spindles and wider wheels strongly suggest the purpose of its existence. With the TI, maybe an orange one that sticks out of the somber grays, steel blues, and whites of Teutonic traffic like one of the weathermen at a police ball, you are the man to be reckoned with in anything but a top end dash down the Autobahn. And as if the TI wasn't enough, those overkill specialists down in BMW's dyno rooms have just put the finishing touches on the T the extra I denotes fuel injection, with bigger exhaust valves and more compression included as frosting. When last we were in Munich the only T engine available for testing was not in a 2002 but in the larger 2000 sedan. With 500 pounds extra weight its acceleration wasn't much better than a 2002 Ti, but it would crank right past the red line in fourth gear with nonchalance. In the smaller car it will be devastating. Meanwhile, back in the States, where exhaust emission controls are the law of the land, you have to settle for the plain vanilla 2002 no TS or IS are permitted. BMW engineers consider the TI a hopeless case when it comes to meeting the emission specs but are optimistic about the injected model optimistic but non-committal when you ask when. Those same engineers shake their heads in mild disbelief at the thought of Americans classifying the detoxed 1600 and 2002 as high-performance automobiles. 
They feel that the necessary air pump and restrictions in ignition timing have hobbled the 2002 almost to the level of the European 1600 and rendered the 1600 a total invalid. The engineers, of course, have numbers to back up their pessimism about the power available in the models imported to the US, but the 2002 is still very definitely a performance car, simply because its capabilities are not based solely on engine output. It's an agility specialist with controls that AC accurately telegraph back to the driver enough about what's going on so that he can comfortably operate near the limits. Its compact dimensions, more than a foot shorter than a Maverick, allow you to squeeze through bottlenecks that no American car could even consider, and the driver's fantastic view of the world around takes the guesswork out of the squeezing operation. The 2002 is happiest in point A to point B dashes, and the more trying the circumstances the better. The ride is not soft but admirably controlled. The car is sure-footed on rough roads and you'll find yourself up-shifting, down-shifting, keeping the revs up and angling through corners at speeds that will make passengers wish they had taken a bus and left the driving to anybody but you. If you are at all susceptible to fantasizing, the 2002 will have you believing that every little outing is a special stage of international rally and prestige of the entire factory rests upon your shoulders. And before you've spent very many miles behind the wheel you'll discover that you can heel and toe like you've been doing it all your life. Yes, heel and toe, that anatomically impossible operation that has resulted in flat spot head tires and grunt gears every time you've tried it, is as easy as closing a door in the 2002. Such is not the stuff sedans are made of, but then we've already established that the 2002 is not a sedan. For this test we have a pair of 2002 non-sedans one with the recently introduced automatic transmission and the other with a standard 4-speed manual. By testing both cars together we could see exactly what effect the automatic has on performance and on the BMW's dashing personality. In both cases the effect is pronounced. BMW buys the automatic from ZF. It's a 3-speed device, with a torque converter and it performs with noteworthy distinction. Part throttle upshifts are very smooth, full throttle upshifts happen at about 6200 rpm, just before the red line, and if you stand on the gas pedal it's smart enough to downshift if it's operating in a speed range that would make that operation at all helpful. And the shift linkage, though not inspired, is simple and accurate enough so that you are not likely to inadvertently make a wrong selection. But all of this favorable comment notwithstanding, the automatic is little more pleasant than having one foot in quicksand. It changes the 2002's nature from aggressive to passive, changes it from a sports car to a sedan, and that is where the water gets deep. The automatic probably hurts performance less than it hurts the performance feel. Quarter mile times were slow ER by 0.7 seconds with the automatic, most of which is lost at the start because there is not enough torque to spin the wheels, and the trap speed was slower by exactly 2 miles per hour. The manual transmission 2002, even with all of its parasitic emission control devices working away, accelerates through the quarter in 17.1 seconds at 78.6 miles per hour which makes it the top eliminator, by a slight margin, over all of the imported cars in its price class. The BMW has about the same edge in handling. The test cars both had the optional front and rear anti-sway bars to complement the traditional McPherson strut front and semi-trailing arm rear SUS pension. Peugeot uses a similar arrangement in the 504 and it's the only other sedan, domestic or imported, in this price class that can match the BMW's handling on poorly surfaced roads. When you see Oerna hard on smooth roads the 2002 as sums a mild understeering attitude which is subject to change without notice. With only a hint of its intentions it will hang its tail out in the kind of fat drip angle that dirt trackers live by. To the timid this probably sounds treacherous, and it would be if the BMW was intent on continuing this tail wag into a spin, but it doesn't. In fact, after a couple of tries you discover you can stay hard on the throttle and use the steering to keep everything pointed in the right direction. That's when it all gets to be fun. The steering has enough feel to be very helpful during these maneuvers, but it's slow, 
3.75 turns lock to lock, ratio means that you will be called upon for some occasional arm winding corrections. Only one situation can embarrass the BMW suspension and that is spinning the rear tires. Every BMW we've ever tried, and that includes the 2800 coupe, suffers wheel hop if you lose traction during AC acceleration. Never mind that the textbooks say it can't happen the Germans have found a way. They've also found a way to make braking performance consistent. Both cars pulled slightly to the left under braking, locked up their front wheels first and required 277 feet 0.77 g to stop from 80 miles per hour even though the stopping distances set no records the brakes do merit high marks because of the accuracy with which you can apply them the power booster is particularly impressive because of its lightning response time which among other advantages allows you to pump the brakes very rapidly should a situation demand it all of this is to say that, as a sports car, the 2002 is more than just agreeable. As a sedan it's not disagreeable but it's not as comfortable as its price would indicate. We are not enamored with the driving position. The large diameter steering wheel is positioned more toward horizontal than conventional Detroit practice, and if you position the seat far enough forward so that the top of the wheel is within easy reach, you find that the control pedals are too close, particularly the accelerator. Since the seat is high you are forced into maintaining an unnatural and tiring angle between the gas pedal foot and its attached leg. Also, the seat backs do not support you in such a way that would be comfortable for long distances. The seats themselves are mildly contoured buckets and do a remarkably good job of restraining you laterally, partially because the deeply textured insert discourages sliding around and partially because the softness of the cushions make them effectively more bucket-like than they would appear. The seat slash shoulder belt arrangement, however, reflects German contempt for fussy attempts at self-preservation. Both straps join, with an unfathomable adjusting system, at a single buckle, and the fixed end of the shoulder strap mounts, below the rear window in such a way that is sure to cause high compressive loads on your spine in the event of a crash. We wouldn't wear the shoulder strap on a bed. While the front seats have plenty of space in every direction for two adults, leg room in the rear is a dear commodity. We have no complaints about head and shoulder space, and because the side windows swing out rather than roll down, the side padding in the elbow area has been moved out toward the exterior sheet metal to give a surprising amount of lateral passenger space. In general, the interior gives the eye impression of good materials and workmanship applied to a conservative design. It's this quality, fortified with sophisticated engineering, that makes the premium German cars, Porsche, Mercedes-Benz, and BMW, highly desirable to the discerning buyer. Considering the Germans' reputation for attention to detail, we find it unthinkable that the 2002, after two years in production, still has an overheating problem. Both of the test cars, if allowed to idle for 10 minutes, even in 30 degrees Fahrenheit weather, would have their temperature gauges reach a steering in the red zone. If it's that bad in the winter, we suspect summer driving in slow traffic would be intolerable. The iMporter had even installed a higher capacity cooling fan in the automatic transmission car, but its most significant contribution was an unpleasant roar at cruising speeds. Overheating isn't the only unpleasantry associated with owning a 2002 as you will probably find out at your dealer's parts counter. Because we've been hearing comments about the high price of BMW parts, Porsche and Mercedes-Benz as well, we checked the prices of a few a muffler, head gasket, clutch assembly, tail light lens, front fender, and front bumper that we felt an average owner would most likely have to replace. Then we compared this list with that of other similarly priced cars, Fiat 124 Coupe, Triumph TR6, Volvo 142, Peugeot 504 and a Chevelle V8. The total for the BMW was significantly higher than for any other car. Because of differences in design for example, the 2002 has a three-piece front bumper and you might get by with replacing only part of it you can't project the entire parts price structure from this short list. Still, we would certainly caution against abusing your clutch, over $100, 
for breaking a tail light lens, almost $17. To speak further of prices would be to belabor the point. In the things that the 2002 does best harassing triumphs, petrifying your passengers and awakening every dormant fangio trait in your psyche it can't be beat. Moreover, it's our firm belief that those things are cheap at any price. And since all of this subversion is camouflaged by the most puritan of sedan bodies your wife won't have a clue until it's too late.